my name is Kim Kinnonen, and uh, been uh, uh, working with browsers, uh, especially WebKit-based browsers, for some time. Um, I did some. Um, uh, I have been some part of some uh, teams creating browsers for mobile devices such, such as uh, Nokia N9, and then most recently um, NVIDIA's uh, Android-based uh, uh, platform, which is then so sold by, of course, other companies. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, give you some details about web-based browsers that you probably have used all um, from the perspective of, of uh, graphics. So, uh, Lauri was talking about page load, which is probably the, the biggest, like, impacting thing uh, from the user, user's perspective. Um, but uh, the graphics part is then uh, uh, sort of a thing that makes everything that already works well. So, when we have uh, reached the state that something works well with respect to page loading, we can uh, also, like perfect the site uh, or the web page by perfecting the the graphics, and and uh, I'm gonna talk um, about uh, so the, if if uh, if we go back a still a bit, so there's these techniques that uh, um, you guys know how to perfect these sites from the graphical perspective, but uh, often it's sort of magic or or maybe frustrating and opaque as to why these uh, techniques work. And uh, today we're going to cover uh, some, some ground on the, on the technical implementation in the engine, and how, how these techniques actually are implemented and why do they work, when do they work, and uh, especially cases that uh, what makes them not work. So, uh, kind of... Uh, you don't, you don't feel, after this presentation, uh, you might not feel as frustrated when, when something that you, you thought that, okay, and, uh, will work perfectly, then doesn't work very well. Okay, and, and here's the agenda. So, we'll begin with uh, uh, some, uh, some prerequisites and then move towards uh, more interesting things. But also with these prerequisites, I'm trying to kind of uh, explain some some things that might be useful in your daily daily work, uh, even though they are sort of uh, from the implementation perspective and uh, the engine implementation perspective. So when we talk about web engine, uh, we talk about the area that you see, the white one, which depicts the the uh, web page. So you have a browser and you have a browser engine. And the browser engine has the responsibility of, of basically asking for a HTML page, reading it, and uh, forming the picture that the web page, uh, web page author has kind of thought that, okay, this page should look like this. And, uh, and also, uh, in order to do this, has to do plenty of stuff, including, for example, executing programs of, of JavaScript and uh, interpreting uh, user interaction. So, so there's a lot of things going on, but in the end, what, what really matters is the picture and, well, nowadays also maybe sound, but the picture is basically what you expect. And what is important to understand is that, that the engine is the, the green one, and the browser, what is, what is the property of the browser is the everything else, so back buttons and uh, URL, to, um, bar, URL bars and such. So what is then WebKit? So probably all, every, everybody has heard the word. So it is a browser engine that, that is uh, uh, open source, that is uh, used in many browsers, and uh, that is very common in in, uh, in mobile browsers. So, as you can see, uh, 
two, two of the biggest uh, WebKit users traditionally have been Safari browser in the Mac, Mac OS uh, system and Chrome browser, which is cross-platform cross and available every, everywhere. Um, nowadays, Chrome is, um, is not using WebKit like in a uh, strict sense. So uh, Google forked WebKit, so begin began their own branch of development. And, and um, as such, these engines are different. But for, for today, we are calling them uh, these both engines like WebKit based engine, engines because this fork has, has, uh, is, is quite recent and uh, currently the engines are based on the same principles. As time goes by, probably this will, uh, at least in the technical uh, solutions or uh, choices, start to differ more and more and um, we'll see maybe a bit different architectures. But today they are kind of say, governed by the same principles. So what is, uh, what is the kind of block diagram or, or box architecture that, that a browser has? Have? So as you can see, the central part is, is uh, is the browser engine which which has the responsibilities of, of doing some something with the web page then a uh, browser is is a lot a lot of other things also and um, kind of important to understand is that uh, for example things like graphics uh, low low level graphics or, or networking are not really considered as a, as part of, of of the web engine itself so for example http implementation implementation typically comes from what we say the platform and not not from the from the uh, uh, web engine so for example mac os you have safari so the http implementation comes from the mac os uh, apis um, uh, similarly for example for graphics uh, different different browsers use different kind of, of graphics apis to implement the drawing even even back in the day when WebKit was just WebKit, no blink, then uh, Chrome, even though it used WebKit, it had different uh, libraries, such uh, for for example for for uh, uh, graphics than uh, uh, Safari. And uh, by by the way, feel free to interrupt anytime and ask questions if, if there is. Yeah. So I do. So okay, <clears throat> you know, let's say that, okay, like uh, Blink uh, on Android would like to depend on some uh, lower level frameworks. Uh, let's say okay, we would be doing like Android adaptation for Blink. So uh, would it be binding some like uh, like uh, Android's own libraries or like low level like all the way like libc and so forth and so forth? And how it comes with like more complex things like audio and let's say camera support? Um, yeah. So Chrome on on Blink. Uh, Chrome and Blink on Android would use the Android's provided uh, services, for example, for camera and for libc. Thing with Android is that you don't have that much of a, of a API. So Android and native development kit, which uh, is used for native applications or native libraries such as Blink. So it's not that wide. So for example, on Android, uh, Chrome has pretty much everything built in and not using that much of the platform. But certainly a camera is something that you cannot bring in as a library because every device has a different camera and, uh, and uh, you cannot, uh, you don't have an, the kind of similar, this kind of common API. So, so for, the, for the camera API, you use the platform. And this uh, this can be kind of seen from this uh, these two pie charts. So we have Chromium, which is the kind of open source part of, of Chrome, which is basically Chrome. So uh, this is the line line of code count for for the that browser. And you can see that there is six million lines of of third party co uh, code. So this red part. So that many libraries you have to have in your source, or that many lines of code you have to have 
on your browser source code tree in order to to get all the functionality that the, that the browser needs. Uh, so the browser itself, in Chromium's case, is quite big, also roughly 4 million lines of code. And, and then uh, what's considered WebKit, uh, the, the web core WebKit itself, and then the JavaScript engine. So together, they're like a million lines of code. Of course, these are just kind of very rough estimates. So, for example, most of these C++ uh, projects contain, for example, C++ unit tests. So, of course, that those are not strictly part of what you get when you download, for example, Chrome or, or Chromium. One question. Yeah. So, uh, because we've been adding all kind of features and everything, uh, I think but in Mozilla maybe it removed support for blink tag, but is, can you see at some point that you would actually start to take some old code which was very useful back in, let's say, uh, 2002, uh, because I think it's just adding more and more and more. You still have probably a lot of hacks in there to make table layouts work, but someday, so do, do you see what you're feeling? Are you taking stuff out already or just adding more and more and more? Yeah, so taking taking things out and making the engine simpler. So certainly, to some level, uh, that is being done. But uh, as you can see from these these numbers, for example, so implementing the Blink tag is is like um, let's say, if it would be thousand lines of code, then then you would still have ten million lines of code. So so to to maintain, uh, of course, in, in abstract sense, you don't. For, for example, for these uh, third-party libraries that Chromium, Chromium uses, not, not, not everybody or not even anybody of the Chrome engineers actually look all of those lines of code. Um, and certainly the idea is that once some, some feature is not important or, or used, then you, you sort of tend to think that, okay, I, I need to make things simpler and, and take something out. On the other hand, you have to maintain backwards compatibility. So typically, it's not, not uh, worth it to actually remove things that uh, are not strictly necessary. So I think from, for this Blink tag, it was more of a hatred towards, <laughs> towards the tag itself, not, not uh, perhaps uh, that big of a deal. Yeah. What happens when there's like some kind of like new like major feature? Let's say for it's like web components. I mean, like okay, what I see in like web components, if you're like really smart, you might be able to kind of like take it in like a like magical refactor your existing code to make it work. But most likely, I would ask what happens is that actually there's some kind of you take you actually you like might like copy paste some of the existing code and basically build a like new chunk or like new component or new feature. How does it actually really happen? Like how how does like new feature get added? Uh, you Is mean, it through like refactoring the existing code or just kind of like uh, making a new like totally isolated piece? You mean like implementing a new feature in WebKit? Yeah. Um, so well, there there is certainly refactoring uh, a lot. Uh, so uh, I, I personally haven't implemented that many new features, just kind of one, one like, which would, would be considered a web feature like media queries. And for, for definitely for that purpose, you have to implement it uh, because there's no such code. So typically you don't, even though there's a lot of code, it, it doesn't, it's not that kind of code that, okay, um, I can get a bulk of, of features from another another part of this code base. So it's not like that. So uh, it's more like uh, that. Okay, this code base pe code base has, let's say, these uh, building blocks like normal, like a vector class or 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 hash map, and there's plenty of those, and you can use those and you can refactor those, but then. Maybe if you're implementing some, some new web, web feature, you, you, there's no code for that. So then there might be some sort of boilerplate codes like uh, JavaScript APIs tend to have similar, similar sort of 
class structure and a similar sort of method structure, and then you just need to kind of implement the actual like beef in the in the logic. So, yeah. So basically, most of the things you have to really write. Um, okay. So this is kind of the size of the project. Though not every browser is, is this big, so, so Chromium is like everything. So as an alternative example, you might have used Android's, uh, Android's like a native WebKit-based browser, which, which is the, uh, what we call old browser before uh, Chrome was uh, kind of brought in as a default browser. So that is only 30,000 line, 30, lines of Java code. So, so that's kind of the other extreme. All right, so now, now that was the history. So we'll go to the runtime architecture. I, I'm not sure if this is the correct term, but basically what happens when you run the program. And uh, you, have, you have two processes. You have UI process and, and a web process. And actually, you might have even multiple web processes. So, so for example, on, on Chrome's case, you might have one process per, per tab, for example. And this is now the kind of kind of a common pattern between current current browsers that you have this separation. So it used to be that we only have one process, and then we we run the, all the pages there. But uh, uh, nowadays we have many processes, or or well, in mob mobile Safari's case, you, you still have many threads. One, one for, for the web content and then one for, you, for the UI. But if we consider, consider this case of web process and UI process, so there's few reasons why this is done. And primary reasons are, are related to security and, uh, and uh, kind of resource management. So security is, uh, is related to the fact that uh, you might have problems with your with your code. You might have bugs. So you're running one million lines of, of your own code, and then up to almost 10 million lines of, of somebody else's code, like video decoders and, and image decoders that you might not have. Your organization might not have uh, created. So obviously there there's going to be bugs, and probably there's going to be security bugs, and. Uh, when we're splitting, splitting this uh, UI and, and the web process into sep separate, two separate things, so then we can kind of limit the, limit the impact that these bugs have. So if you have a page that crashes your uh, HTML uh, processing component, which is the web process, then you don't still crash the whole UI. And this is pretty nice from, from the user's per perspective, of course. Um, also, it's uh, this is a thing that mo you don't really th think about, but uh, it's uh, it's kind of apparent af after you start implementing these things is that in in web everything can be arbitrary. So you, you might have very big anything. So you might have big HTML pages, megabyte, ten megabytes, hundred megabytes. You might have big uh, images. Same thing. 100 megabyte pictures, and and you still need to work whatever whatever it takes, and of course, by working you might have multiple definitions. So so it might be kind of okay that uh, um, if user user loads 100 megabyte HTML file which has 10,000 100, 100 megabyte images, then you might actually crash, or you might say that okay. Now the web page has gone like unresponsive, but it's not okay to grasp the UI process. So this this kind of this process separation uh, also solves these sort of problems that uh, that um, uh, you cannot really control the the content. And then there's also uh, the interactivity. So so as I said, if the web page goes. Uh, um, like unresponsive, then your your UI can still uh, act on the uh, user interaction. 
but so when thinking about this uh, this uh, split uh, there's a couple of kind of things that impact actual web development and one of these things is um, uh, interactivity with respect to touch events for example or, or mouse events so since we since we are separating separating these uh, uh, processes so there's bound to be some lag between passing something from here to here and, and the user always operates here so if he does a touch event or touch, touch gesture and it has to go through here if we want to process it here and uh, Good example is uh, is panning because there the user moves their finger in order to pan the page, and you want that to be very very fast. You want that to be very uh, responsive. But on the other hand, if you have, for example, touch event handlers in your web page, that means that you have to send these touch events to the page so that the page can say that okay, did I want to process this event and did I want to capture this event, uh, event or, or did I want to kind of prevent any action that this event uh, would normally uh, do. So I'm sure all of you know what, what the, when you prevent the default action of the uh, event, uh, for example, for, for this panning case, if, if you prevent the touch begin, it means that, that the panning of the page doesn't happen. And this is especially bad if you are uh, doing this capturing of the events and you're not doing anything with the events. So, for example, if you're attaching a, a touch event handler to the document root, pay, uh, root element or the document, uh, and then you're kind of going in the event handler that, okay, do I want this event? No, maybe not. It didn't hit my image or it didn't hit my shopping cart. And, and then you get these events all the time. But what the user actually sees is that when he starts to pan, there's a lag of, let's say, 200 milliseconds, and, and then, the, then the page starts to pan. So don't do it. Instead, attach your event handlers to the elements that want the interaction. And so you might have noticed, uh, I think half a year ago still, Wikipedia had, had this problem. So whole page was, uh, was uh, capturing all these events. Also sometimes, for example, Helsingin Sanomat, a big newspaper here in Finland, so they, they either it was uh, some sort of ad problem or whatever, but what, whatever it was, the, the feeling was that when you started panning something, it didn't really start panning, but it, it kind of waited for a while and then it started panning. Another thing is that, okay, since we have this IPC, the events might not kind of get to you as quickly or as, as uh, in the same order as you might expect. So you need to code defensively. They should still come like uh, in order of that the spec, specs say, but they might not. And uh, even if they do, they might not come uh, according to your app's uh, expectations. So, so even even this kind of implementation detail where, where the web, web pages process can have pretty big like uh, impact on, on how, how do you, how do you do your pages. Now moving on to uh, more closer to the graphics part. So here we have an overall picture of how the data gets transformed from the kind of bits that you transfer in the network into the actual pixels. So this is a kind of block diagram where you can kind of uh, imagine bits going in. It's not, uh, it's uh, oriented towards this graphics topic here. So if we look into detail into the uh, diagram, there there was uh, this phase of uh, constructing the DOM DOM tree, probably very very um, uh, common for you guys, and and kind of you know this stuff. So just uh, as a kind of getting getting up to speed, we need DOM tree 
from this, uh, the strings that we pass from the server to the to the browser. And uh, then we have the CSS layout. So you you have your DOM tree, you have your CSS style rules, and you combine them so that uh, uh, you create uh, this page layout. And how it works is that for each of these DOM elements in WebKit, you, you create this sort of render object tree that you can have to see here. And, and there's some rules how, how each of the DOM elements uh, map to kind of rendering tree elements. And uh, so first of all, first you kind of create these uh, elements, and then you do style selection. So you try to see the CSS file, how, how each of these rules apply. So for example, this one matches here in this span, and, and this, this information is recorded in the, in the render tree as a pro property of this render tree node. It's actually, the style system creates its own tree also called style tree, but we're not going into that, that one. But the important thing to understand is that here we have something that we, we manipulate with JavaScript, for example. So this is language of, of your, your web development. And this is then one of the aspects of it when we try to render that that uh, uh, that structure also there's details like uh, it's not one to one mapping so for example here we yeah, have div and span element but here we have what's called an anonym, an anonymous uh, render block uh, which uh, uh, rules of it uh, these kind of transformations are based on the CSS layout rules but they are kind of implementation details for, for these purposes. So now we're approaching the graphics part. Uh, since we already have a thing called render tree, where typically rendering means that you have something that you can produce graphics out of. And uh, intuitively, you can guess that, OK, when you, when you walk the render tree, you can produce the, the pictures that you want. Uh, but before we can actually do that in, in a web browser, we need still at least one more tree. So we have, we have the render tree, but we need to add a render layer tree. And uh, this is now, we have a different page here which tries to depict the difference between uh, or the importance of, of the render layer tree. So CSS is, is uh, formatted or, or rendered by the rules of CSS formatting model. Sort of one, one of these specs that define how, how each style is mapped to graphical objects, let's say that this way. And uh, what, what are the steps that you, you do this? And, and then this uh, render, la render layer tree and, and, and render object tree are kind of implementations of this visual formatting model. An important thing to understand here is that in, in WebKit we have render layer and, and it is representing mostly stacking contexts in, in uh, CSS. Anybody have an idea like what is a stacking context? This is the one that you get when you have what trust say hack. Yeah, yeah. So so it, raise hands if you know what, what a stacking context is. Yeah, here. Good, good. So so stacking context is stacking context is, is pretty important thing when you think about CSS uh, like layouts and uh, CSS graphics in general. What it means is, is, is just that when you paint the page, you traverse uh, the, the stacking contexts in order, and you always paint the, the stacking context 
and each child before kind of moving to uh, moving uh, downwards in the in the stacking on the stream. And what what it means in this case? So we have hello, and and we added thing opacity, which makes it uh, stacking context in order to trying to kind of uh, visualize what is what is uh, what, what are the stacking contexts. Of course, we need a root stacking context, which is is the HTML element because that is the first element of, of the do document. We have a root, which is always a always a, a stacking context, and then you have few rules which create stacking contexts. And then you, you paint the page by basically painting stacking context below certain stacking context, then you paint the stacking context itself, and then you paint the, the, the stacking contexts above, above the particular stacking context. Does like a stacking context like always imply that in practice uh, you would create a texture of this result when you paint it? Paint it? Uh, it doesn't. Okay. So I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll go through it in a bit. Uh, so when, when, when we now approach or actually land to the graphics land, so when we paint a page so we have we have the dom we do the layout and then we get the render tree and then the layer tree we we we, we are ready to paint a page and basically how do we paint it we have uh, we have the order and we need to traverse the the uh, the, the layer tree and then the render tree in, in the correct order. And for each node, you basically paint the node and the node itself knows how to paint it. So node, node can say, for example, let's say uh, this guy or this guy can say that, okay, I have red background col color. So I, I'll say that, okay, context, draw, draw rect, and then it's rectangle and it's, it's color. And, and the context is sort of abstract uh, implementation of, of these drawing commands. So you can have draw a rectangle, draw, draw a line, draw, draw text. Text is very important. And uh, when, you, when you walk for each, each of these render objects, you, you say paint and then you have give the context, and this guy gives the context to this guy, and this guy gives context to this guy. And for each of these visits, you, you do some operation, like here you say draw text. Then that, that produces a picture. Now, it can be a bitmap picture, or it can be a display list, which is uh, basically a recording of these, these, um, these commands. Now to the question of whether these, these stacking contexts always uh, create a sort of texture, so no. So typically when you render a page, you would go like this. So you go here, then you return, then you go here, and you paint. And, and all, all of this, if you were painting to the same bitmap, so it would just go to a normal bitmap. But you would have 800 by 600 bitmap to paint this. And also, you have very many, many stacking contexts, so very many render, render layers. So you might have, let's say, let's say 100. So all of your relative position uh, elements that have z-index of, of whatever else than auto. So you would have those as uh, layers. And the importance of the layers is really that, well, kind of you can guess it from the opacity and, and jet index and such. So, so that, that really defines the, the order of the, of the web page paint.
All right. So this is uh, what what we call paint from the WebKit engine. So you have have a you have formed this this tree structure, and then you walk it, and for each node, you you give uh, um, the context, and then, then the node can can draw itself in the context. Okay, so now if we go and see how in practice this uh, UI process and the web process communication works in this setting. So UI, UI process in abstract says that, okay, I have shared memory area and I want to have certain area of the web page painted to it. And then web process, uh, web process catches that area and constructs kind of encapsulates the area in, in graphics context and gives that to the render tree. Then the render tree is walked uh, in the order of the uh, render layers and each, each of the command when you call this, this graphics context with for example draw line, draw text, then the actual kind of pixels get there. And once you're done, you get the picture. And, and once you have the picture, you can say to the UI process that, OK, now I have, have done the picture. And then, then the UI, UI process has, has the picture, and it can do something with it, probably show it to the user. And this is a fairly slow process, so this is uh, how how normal web pages would be uh, would be painted in some cases, especially in kind of desktop browsers. But as you can see, the user fell asleep, so we should do something about it. But uh, already, if if we uh, stop for a while for this, so if we think about this this uh, this process. And, and, and especially this sort of traversal. Uh, so you can imagine that if you have 10,000 DOM elements and you don't even have a one-to-one -one mapping, you might have like one-to-five mapping. Or, well, you don't have that, but you might have more than 10,000 of these elements. So it's bound to be kind of slow. And, and then the uh, question is that, okay, or you're thinking that how, how can I make this fast and then you go to the web and then you see that okay uh, there's some tips that okay what, what you what you should do you should, shouldn't do document dot write because that causes parsing the DOM part that we talked about you shouldn't do uh, append element because uh, that that changes the DOM tree and then you have to do layout or you, you shouldn't uh, change class for example and with this one, you can kind of think that, okay, if I do something with the text, I cause parsing and then layout and then paint. But if I do, let's say, add element, then I don't do parsing, but I do DOM and whatever. But, and this works. It's, it's kind of good way to think about it. If you know these steps that, okay, what, what the browser does. The problem with it is that it's sort of implementation dependent and, and you don't really actually know. You have to always guess and then, then depending on, you don't even know if you guess right or wrong if the difference is, is small. So good, good example is that uh, uh, you might need to kind of or you would think that, okay, I'm doing some operation that shouldn't... So, for example, I'm, I'm adding an element that I don't have a CSS selector for. So, ergo, I shouldn't be um, laying out anything. There shouldn't be a layout because there's no CSS selectors for it. So, it cannot kind of... Well, assuming that there's no style, but of course there's default styles and such. But uh, even if you kind of in your mind could deduce that uh, this is uh, this shouldn't cause parsing or, or 
or this shouldn't cause layout, then you're not really sure. And, and uh, even if you are correct, it's not sure that the engine can prove that. So best, best practice is that, OK, have as, as little content as possible. So have as little CSS uh, rules as you can have. So then there's no overhead, uh, like extra overhead for the style selection, for example. Then there's uh, tips like, OK, you can change only things that affect the, the painting. So if you're not changing something that affects the layout, then you're skipping the layout. For example, background color. So then you, you would have the same render tree, but you would just need to go, go over it again. And that's a, that's a good, good uh, suggestion also. So, and some, sometimes he, that even works. Sometimes it's hard to know even does that work. So if you, if you change, you don't have borders and you add borders and you have margin or whatever and the layout doesn't kind of change. So, so can you prove that, okay, the layout doesn't need to change? And can WebKit prove that, okay, or does it, does it have, has somebody written that, okay, if, if we have margin and we have padding and then we have adding a border, we don't need to lay out. Sometimes there's a lot of that in WebKit, but, but still it's not really intuitive for the web developer. Um, and the problem with that is that for, for, for things that you want to be fast, it's not fast enough. And the uh, biggest th thing, of course, is animations. And, and this brings us to the point that, OK, then you get the suggestion that, OK, if you need to animate, you use CSS transforms. And this brings us to the compositing part of, of WebKit. Oh, well, lost the lights here. Before we go to the compositing, um, so I mentioned that, okay, we want to, do, typically we want to do something with the animations. So it's not that critical if you show your web page once that it's, it's fast on the screen. If it's 100 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds, you don't care. But if you're running an animation, so 100 milliseconds versus 50 milliseconds, so that's kind of, you're doubling the frame rate when you, you're faster. Uh, but we don't want to do JavaScript animations. So they kind of have similar ideas and similar things like CSS transforms work for JavaScript, but there's the problem of, of actually running JavaScript and it makes everything uh, harder to kind of explain and also it's not as, as like smooth from the animation perspective. So, so what, what we, we're here trying to uh, uncover is the kind of the graphical internals of the engine and those are very well or very much better explained with this uh, CSS animations. Uh, any, anybody who have used CSS animations like? Oh, so great. Probably no more than I do. Um, so I, I'll give, give you still kind of target demo what we want to achieve. So this is, this is the classic WebKit uh, demonstration of, of CSS transforms. So everything here is a web, web page and these are images, these, these leaves that, that fall and then this is like live normal text. And you can see that there's no, uh, no like pre-baked uh, images that you would have, for example, this, this uh, text in. So all, all of this is uh, live CSS data. And uh, nothing is JavaScript, so everything is just CSS declarations also. Let's get back to the demonstration. So the, we want to understand that, okay, at least some parts what, what is that made out of? And, or let's say in another way, we would like to do that sort of animation and, and understand that uh, 
how how can how can this be done? So obviously, if we go back and look back to the previous uh, painting example, if you have sort of if you ha have to go through that render tree traversal for every frame of your animation, then it, it's quite slow. And it, well, uh, you just have to believe me that if that would that, that previous animation would do that then you wouldn't see many frames per second for that you you would see some but that's not enough um, and uh, so th there's a couple of problems or big problems so one is that when you have big render trees you have to traverse a lot of data so that's one thing then the other thing is that when you have have this apply operations on, on this graphics context. So at this moment, currently, all the browsers do this in uh, CPU. So all these draw lines, draw texts, uh, draw images, it's a, these are CPU operations. Well, at least that we know of. Uh, may, maybe some parts of, for example, Safari, some some of the operations are accelerated with GPU, but in general, this is a CPU type of of drawing or painting. And and then then there's the problem that if you do something that causes a layout, then you have to lay out, and then you can start the render tree build up, and then you can traverse the render tree, and then you have the the rasterize operations, and then you do the rasterization. So it's a very, very tedious business. What is then the solution is, is what we call compositing. So the idea is pretty much pretty simple and probably everybody is aware of it, at least in some sense. So what you, what you do is you kind of scissor out or draw in isolation, paint in isolation these, all these parts that are somehow part of the animation. Then you, you render them into separate bitmaps or, or textures. And, and then when you play back the animation, you composite them together in according to what the animation says. So here we have the kind of different layers. So these ones are part of the, part of the animation in, in the end, end result. So this is what we want. And this solves these the previous problems in a ways in 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 few few different ways so we had the pro problem that the render trees get really big so with this compositing we only have to traverse for each of these layers which are actually these render layers so we have to just traverse the subtree for this one subtree for this one and sub subtree for this one and for example, this one, this is just a one image, so it's very shallow. So that, that's a, it's a fast, and also we have to do, do it just once. We want to do it just once for the normal case, and then we have, want to apply the animation later. The second thing is that, that uh, even though we are, we are, we might, at currently, even though we did everything with CPU, we did th these pictures with CPU, then we can do the compositing part with GPU, and, and that is very fast. So that, that, is, that is really, really much faster than, than CPU in, the, in this operation. And of course, kind of the, the third problem is that um, with the compositing, we have some operations that we know don't cause layout. So we have some properties that you modify and that doesn't cause layout, which means that you don't need to build up these new trees all over again from the scratch. What do we do if we run out of GPU memory? Say we have like too many elements to fit into. So then, then, then we just well, in theory, you could kind of optimize it. So, so for example, that you would stack some some of these layers together, and then that some of the animations run like fast. But in practice, you just drop everything and, and draw from the render tree. So 
then you get the slow case if you run out of memory. And, and that is a frequent thing in the mobile devices. On, on desktops, you don't really run out of memory, you just swap, at, at least to some extent, until, un, until you crash or something. I, I'm, I don't know how, what, what the, how do you imp implement the limits or what kind of limits the, the browser developers ha have chosen for each particular browser. So a anybody who have used this, uh, this transform, translate 3D thing? Yeah, everybody, okay. So, um, so just going through it quickly. Uh, so, the idea is that you say that okay, some part of some element is transformed, so you can move it around in the screen. Actually, you can move it around in the 3D space, and that doesn't cause layout. <coughs> Since you have the original picture, then you can just move it to what what direction you want. Uh, there's also the property of this, this uh, CSS property is that uh, the element becomes positioned and so it, it, from the layout perspective, so CSS flow perspective, it's uh, similar to position relative or position absolute, so you render it by after the normal flow. And it creates a stacking context. So this is sort of partly CSS semantics, partly implementation choice. So since it, it creates stacking context, it's sort of natural to be cut out of the web page. So if it didn't do that, it would be kind of, from the CSS layout perspective, it would be part of the, the uh, parent stacking context. And then it's harder to cut it out or render it in isolation. So, and the properties that we can uh, uh, use with the compositing, so we have just two. So there's transform and opacity. And uh, so probably if you have used, used transform, you, you might have used, for example, with this one. So you say that, okay, we don't actually we have an identity transform which says that the element looks like what it is, but instead, uh, uh, or even, so you, you say it uh, by means of just saying that, okay, jet is zero, which means jet is by default zero, but you, you still say that, okay, jet is still zero. And that tells, tells the engine that, okay, the author says that he wants this layer to be uh, accelerated. So it might have been uh, implemented so that if you say, for example, translate Z, it doesn't do anything because there's no difference. And for example, translate X, it, it does that. So it, there's no difference. It doesn't create any any um, layers. But for, for uh, I think, kind of the original, de original designers of this feature left this translate Z as a, as a kind of means for the web developers to kind of hint that, okay, this should go into a layer. But if you, if you create animations, you don't need to do that. You don't need to force, force this layering to happen. Instead, you just say that, okay, you animate this one or this one, like in this, this case. And, and dur dur for the duration of the animation, you have the layer. But when the animation is not running, you don't have the layer. And it's good because it saves memory. So, so remember that. Um, now, now you, when you use it, when you, when you use this feature, we had, had, had a render tree that then contained these, or referenced these render objects. So we had sorry, render layer tree. So when you use uh, this compositing, what internally gets uh, done is that WebKit goes into this compositing mode and, and you have, you create another layer, uh, another layer tree, which is this graphic layer tree, which represents what you would call the textures of the 
kind of the to, to be composited areas. So for here, uh, for example, here you have a root layer, which is your probably your <coughs> root stacking context, which is the HTML element, and then you have, have it has some some layers painted to it. So so this is the case that okay, this guy doesn't have the, its own. We call it backing storage, but it's kind of just uh, painted to its parent ba backing storage, which is which is this one, and or th this render layer, graphics layer three node actually contains the back backing storage. But anyway, and uh, for thi this, so somebody has said said that okay, translate jet zero. So this guy got its own own layer, and and similarly this guy. This might might be animating opacity, for example. And what makes it makes this fast is that you you paint these these subtrees into memory that eventually ends up as a texture in the OpenGL or uh, video system memory. Nowadays, everything is OpenGL behind the scenes, so so you get a GL texture. And this is this is all happening uh, typically in, in the web process. So we we are still in the web process, and especially this part is, is this is also in the web main thread, where everything else regarding to the web happens. Now, this is the so we, we here we are creating the content. Now we need to show the content to the user and. That's where the browser UI process has to come 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 with come into the play, uh, and here, uh, in case of uh, Chromium, what we what what then ends up happening is that there is a sort of compositor thread, which has the task of of then flattening the stack of of all these layers, and does it with OpenGL to let's say does it to the to a texture. After after this this flattening has happened, it posts that okay I have a new frame. Post it posts this message to the Chrome UI process. The UI process itself has also graphics, the address bar, the back button, and so so on. So we can take those, draw those in the frame buffer, and and combine that. With, uh, with the web page, and then we say that okay, now we have a full frame of the what what user wants to see, and then we send that to the windowing system process, which, for example, in Linux case might be X11. Uh, so this process is sort of simplified. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, how about special cases, say like running video? Does it still come from I don't know? I, I remember in back in the good old days in the X11, for instance, okay, it actually would be, how to say, like, done, done in, in the video memory, so actually would be really okay to reserve some of the overlay. Yeah, so video, I'm not per perfect person to talk about video and, and especially about Linux video. I don't know if there is such a, such a person, but uh, so you, you might have, as you said, an overlay. So these guys would not see the actual data, <coughs> and, and the video decoder would kind of decode here, and then say that okay, I have video this video frame now ready, and it, they would post it here, and and these guys would post post the picture here and say that okay, and put this overlay video on top of, of, of whatever we have. The problem with that sort of composition is that what if you have web page element on top of the video? Because then you, you cannot really do that anymore. Because if you, you say that, okay, I have here, there is a black box on top of it, which there is a log of SC5, for example. Then you cannot overlay anymore. And this is um, typically done so that well, I can tell you how it's done in Android browser. So, what you what you have is 
that you you decode the the image in, in here and and so the image decoding is not actually kind of uh, let's say windowing system property and you actually have a handle like a texture ID for the video uh, layer so you might say here that okay composite the picture with the video going uh, to the screen position let's say if, if this this was the screen so this position you have video video is OpenGL ID 300 and then all this time the, the video decoder might be still decoding the the frame and even though you say that okay now start uh, start or when you, you when you composite the video frame here it sort of at least con in conceptual level it doesn't need to be ready until here and uh, de depending on the hardware and the platform and the sta other parts of the stack that might actually work or that might not work and that might be uh, fast or not might not be fast but this is uh, uh, certainly sort of very very uh, advanced but also very platform dependent um, yeah uh, and as a, as a side side uh, remark I said that we're not looking at the JavaScript um, JavaScript uh, way of animating in this pre presentation. So, so one one of the kind of key points to understand that, for example, if you have a CSS animation, in theory the web web process will, at least in some systems like like uh, Safari with color animation, it might send that instead of sending sending that okay here is our frame. It says that okay, here is our what we want to composite, and and these layers will move in time, this this sort of way, and then this information is preserved all all, all the way to here, and then what you can do is that you can run the CSS animation here without ever going going here, evaluating the interpolating, let's say, x-axis values. I'm not 100% sure if that's working or if, if anybody's doing that at the moment. Probably Chrome is not doing, doing it. Uh, but in the, eventually th th that can be done also. Um, now, it's, uh, this compositing solution is very very good point solution for this sort of use case. There is uh, obvious problems um, one one of which is is that when you generate these pictures they might be big they might be kind of big but whatever they are they still take time to rasterize so producing the actual picture from the commands like draw text and draw line and and we have a solution where we can move move the kind of the actual creating the pixels to a different different thread so when we do the render tree traversal instead of building the image like this this guy here in here we would just write here that okay there's three draw lines 50,000 draw texts and 10,000 draw rects at these these coordinates and then we get get this information to a different thread and then we play, play that back in the different thread while the engine can still run for example JavaScript at the same time or after after it, they traverse this tree or the engine traverse this tree <coughs> very fast because it does need to actually put the pixels in, in place then it goes to do some, some JavaScript processing and in the meantime you produce the picture in another thread, in another core of the CPU. And then you give it back. And we can even have multiple threads doing the same same thing, the rasterization part. Uh, so that, that's one problem and one solution. Uh, maybe perhaps the bigger problem is that 
you can imagine that your web page is, is very long, so it's 10,000 pixels long or, or 100,000 pixels long. It's, it's just, just one CSS property like height. And then you can make this, this sort of uh, pages contain as long elements. And those elements can be composited also. So you mark this transform Z to a 100,000 pixel element. So how's, how's that going to work out? Not very well because, for example, GPUs have texture size limits and you don't have that much memory and, and all, all, all these sort of problems. So we have a solution for that too. It's tiling. So instead of drawing the whole whole uh, element, you, you divide it into a small pieces and, and draw these pieces in, in individual textures. And then when you want to split this to the screen, you split each individu individual pictures. And, and then you don't need to draw them all, you just need to draw whatever you need. And then when you Show, want to show some new new things, you need to just make sure that you have the uh, kind of thing that spans the whole whole viewport. So this is solving basically the the problem that you have big elements. And it, it by the way, it wasn't when this feature was first done. It wasn't like this. So if you had too big too big element, then you 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 were you were not getting the benefits. So uh, it's uh, sort of complex to implement this. Another problem is that you, you really cannot arbitrarily uh, turn, or, or you can turn this compositing on for an arbitrary element. But the implication is that then due to jet ordering and the ordering of the layers, you might need to uh, turn other layers compositing as well, even though the author has not kind of said that, okay, transform jet zero. So you can imagine, for example, this guy being composited. So that it means that if it's gonna move below here, it's gonna shine through here, which means that either you have to update from the render tree its frame, or then this guy needs to be also composited. But then that means that it's gonna, it's probably gonna move here also, which means that this guy needs to be composited. And you have to make this, uh, first of all, you have to calculate this, which is kind of, it's solved, but then uh, what, what is important is that all these layers consume memory. So it's, <laughs> for the web developer, it's, it's just, uh, translate jet zero, but for the browser it's, it might mean 100 megabytes of texture data. So that's that's something that you kind of need to keep in mind, especially uh, when you run into, let's say, bugs or, or uh, kind of uh, complex layouts that then uh, sort of actually induce this. Yeah, there was a question. Uh, okay, just one question because you keep on talking about the cost resources, but obviously battery, I think, the most cost resource, so uh, it's faster or the most most efficient because you have to probably keep tabs off on power usage, so go through this. Yeah. Uh, so is, by your experience, is the faster stuff usually also, or do you need to make compromises that you could do fancy stuff, but you decide not to do it because it is, I don't know if the CPU is the thing that would be the problem. In mobile devices, but you yeah, or there's certainly a lot of things that, a uh, lot of discussion around the battery life. But the thing is that if you do do scene like that, it's easy to run out of memory, and when you run out of memory, your your browser dies, and then you, then then the user sees that, right? But if you do that, then that consumes half of your battery life the user, or let's say 10% of your battery life, then the user doesn't see it actually. So so it's sort of, what you end up doing is uh, typically we have these solutions uh, and we're not in that advanced state that you, you could kind of make decisions that, okay, 
I, I'll write a battery um, friendly algorithm for compositing. You don't do that. You might say that, okay, we don't spend three years implementing some sort of feature, probably uh, because that, that feature will consume too much battery. So it's in that level, so that you kind of choose your, your uh, kind of architecture or, or your uh, kind of what you, what you invest in, in terms of, let's say, manpower more at this stage. Maybe, maybe later on, especially when we start using more GPU, it will be such that you can select that, okay, do you want, want to do it fast or do you want to do it uh, um, power efficient? Something that will be kind of uh, thought, but not, not in day-to-day in -day life, you don't see that. Yeah, so, so back to the solution. So basically, solution for this problem is that you, you have to be aware of the memory problem and then just don't, don't do it. And uh, that, that's the kind of the takeaway um, that you can have. Uh, I can give you a short demo also for that if we have still a bit of time. Sorry. So here I have a op opacity animation on, on these these two two layers, and uh, so so Safari has apparently can show you how how much your layers consume. So just a good way to kind of see that, okay, now animation is not running, so I can show even in the animation makes sense. So the animation is the same as, as what we had, had in the slide, so animate the opacity, but you don't have any, any sort of forcing, forcing of, the, of the layers here in the CSS. And, and then you can really see that, okay, it consumes one megabyte of, of memory, and, and we have also animation on the inner inner thing and that consumes a bit less uh, memory so so this is then the practical cost that you you're you're gonna use uh, now um, go, yeah Uh, yeah, so if you're animating these two properties, transform and opacity. No, no, I mean, I mean, Sorry, or what was the question? I don't need also opacity, but any of this, uh, any, uh, you know, moving objects or whatever. So all of those are not serving on this, uh, this uh, composition, uh, this bitmap. Sorry, I, I don't quite hear you. Can you? Well, what I'm basically asking is that I, I hate CSS animation. Yeah. Hard. It's so complicated yeah. stuff. I like JavaScript animation yeah. a lot. And I'm trying to figure out ways to do that efficiently. I understand CSS trans animations are super efficient because the programs are optimized. So can you kind of give a hint what happens under the hood so we can kind of emulate that with JavaScript? Or is it possible? Yeah, yeah. So, as I'm... Um, sorry. So you you have structure like that where where you run your animation based on a timer. So when you assign to this WebKit transform, so you have here in the slide you have e dot style dot property. If you replace this property with WebKit animation, then you can assign the same property or the same value, same transform as, as with the, with the uh, CSS animation. And that will turn the, uh, that will turn the element as, uh, to a compositing layer if you have the translate jet or translate 3D. And then you can also modify the opacity. But if you say just opacity something, opacity something, opacity something, that's gonna, not going to be a layer. But you, if you say 
Webkit transform is uh, translate z zero, opacity is point half. Then you have have the layer, and you can then move the opacity also as long as you have the Webkit transform with JavaScript. So did did it answer? Okay. Yeah. So moving on. So this is. So we've co covered compositing uh, with the ele elements. Now going bit bit back to actually more common and more more sim simpler case, but probably something that y you've all also come across, which is that the case of of scrolling. So users, when when they use web pages, the primary operation is scroll, and that needs to work. The problem is that if you if you're gonna paint from the render tree, that that operation is also uh, kind of uh, slow, and it's slow if you do like 800 times 600 pixels, and it's also slow if you do even like one pixel or let's say 10 pixel uh, by by 600 pixels, for example. So strips of these. So it's, it kind of tends to still be kind of slow. It works on the desktop, but mobile browsers, no way. And what is, what is a solution for that is, is basically sort of similar idea what, what, what we have had with the compositing, but, but with the normal page without compositing elements. So if you have a normal page on a, let's say, mobile device, you're going to do this, that you, you render the whole page, or almost the whole page, and then you move the viewport inside that kind of sheet that contains the, the whole page. This is very fast, and, and you can do cool tricks like zooming and such. And, and, and kind of the idea is that you, you do this once, this, this page in the web process, and then you move this viewport in the UI process where you have all, all this information already. Whether that's actually done that way or whether the process is, is compositing, uh, that's a kind of s slight detail. But you might have kind of ran into these problems with this tiling approach and maybe wondered why, why some things work very badly. So one of the problems is that sometimes you create a page where you have, for example, on, on scroll event handler, then you modify the page in the on, on scroll event handler, then it kind of works on the de desktop, and then then you you look at look at the page on on, on iPhone, for example, or, or Android device, and then you see that oh, this is not not really scrolling very well. It's kind of you scroll and then you see the updates or you might not even see the updates or you might see partial updates. And it's because you're doing something with the JavaScript, you're changing the, uh, the, the picture that you have here. So you, your JavaScript time runs to change some, some text property here. And, and we have to o do almost all of this again for each movement each time you run the JavaScript callback. And so that's one problem. And uh, another problem is that if something actually doesn't change when the user scrolls, so if, if something stays stationary, so, so, you know, fixed elements, you have a menu item that doesn't move when you, you, you scroll, then you can imagine that if you have this sheet that is pre-baked image of your page, then you move it up, but suddenly some element needs to stay where it, where it was before. So it cannot happen because the sheet moves, every element moves uh, with respect to each other, or uh, let's say every element stays in place with, uh, with respect to each other. So that's going to be uh, kind of bad and, and hard with the tile tiled approach. Also, th there's some, some very complex or more complex things. So problems, and then we have solutions. 
So sometimes JavaScript engineers or front-end engineers use CSS transforms as a silver bullet. Now the web engine developers use, use the me same mechanism for kind of si silver bullet. So you use the compositing to kind of fix these problems for the tiling of the, of the basic base page. So WebKit has this position sticky, which kind of implements what you have, like majority of the use cases of on-scroll event handler. So you might have some menu that is stationary to your page, but when you scroll up and the menu would go out of the viewport, then you, with JavaScript, you move the menu back into the viewport. So this is what WebKit Sticky does, but instead of JavaScript, you can use, uh, it, it will use internally, it will use uh, compositing. So then, then there is the position fixed. So menu item doesn't move at all. When you scroll, that is composited to on mobile devices. The problem with that is that it actually breaks CSS. So it's, it's kind of hard to do that with composition just because CSS position fixed, so it's not a stacking context. So you, it's, if you have an element that is position fixed, then you kind of cannot cut it out of the page that easily. What, what, what uh, mobile Safari and, and Google browsers do, they do it anyway. So they pretend that, okay, it is a, a stacking context and then just do it. So it simplifies many things and you don't have to do runtime on scroll uh, checks. The, what you see as a result is that the jet ordering that you have on your uh, fixed position element is not correct. So if you use jet index as a child, in a child of a fixed position, then kind of gets messed up because previously you thought that the jet index would apply to the parent stacking context, but now it applies to the fixed element. So just to be aware of, of this. And for, for these very complex cases, it's still kind of complex. And kind of uh, depending a bit on the browser, how do you want to solve it. So for example, you might solve the problem of plugins by saying that, okay, I don't like plugins, we don't have plugins, which is a kind of good way to solve problems. It doesn't help always, but sometimes. Now, on the last, last uh, part, this, uh, this tiling thing, so just the implications for you, if you're doing web pages, is that uh, don't do don't do JavaScript on scroll. It's not good. At least don't take, don't do anything that modifies anything. Yeah. Yeah. What I noticed that actually uh, on iOS 7 you have to include JavaScript on scroll. You just don't trigger any event. Ah, interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah. So so that is kind of using the same same problem solving as as with the plugins. That okay. We don't, we don't want that. It is a good, good way to solve some problems. And, and then if you're using jet indexing, kind of you, you need to maybe freshen up your stacking context rule, rule skills so that you don't have those problems. So, so the development for that uh, fixed position element and, and, and Jet index is that it might be changed in future uh, future CSS specs. So so there's maybe Google is is driving that effort that okay you would change CSS so that uh, fixed elements would be stacking context, which kind of would make sense, I guess. Then whether that's going to happen and ever uh, that's that remains to be seen. Uh, as a spec, of course, it happens as a, as a browser implementation today. So, yeah, so that's pretty long uh, discussion about internals of, of rendering 
at, at least some snapshot of it. Um, things to kind of remember, maybe some might be quite simple for you guys, but like, yeah, web engine is the part that does the engine uh, web web part, so it doesn't do back buttons, doesn't do address bars, or or even doesn't do maybe all of the networking, but it does web things, and and then so there's a these engines are are code like a, any other code, so there's bugs, there's features, and they work the way they work because of some some uh, reason, and not you don't need to say that okay it's magic or you don't need to find out so so you can find out and and sometimes you you can uh understand that okay why certain things happen at least if you dig deep enough so you might might need to dig kind of deep um yeah and, and maybe when you think about writing pages or you write some page and then you think that okay why is this fast or why is this not fast? Then at least one rule of thumb that I use, kind of thinking, okay, what is the information flow? And, and basically, do I need to uh, share this information with the web engine process or the things that, for example, JavaScript, if, if I do anything with the JavaScript, it needs to go from the user to the JavaScript and back, whereas if, if if you can imagine that the browser can do something without the JavaScript, like React to panning event, then you can see that, okay, that might be like fast. And, and then you might might be able to kind of deduce some, some things about your application performance. So that's about it. So any, any questions?